Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here from TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, the greatest live broadcast in all of YouTube. What we do here on Getting Sketchy is we try to create a drawing for you within 45 minutes with a bit of instruction, fun instruction sprinkled in there. And we do this, of course, live. So any mistakes that we make, any crazy things that we say, well, we can't take them back because uh, we're live here on YouTube. And tonight is marking the last drawing session of season eight. And Ashley's gonna be doing the drawing for us tonight, which is why I'm sitting over here. And he's sitting right over there. How are you doing tonight? Ashley? I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks for asking. I hope you guys are all doing really well out there. Uh, we've got a drawing that is a little bit complicated today in terms of its shapes, but we've got some tricks to help us lay that out. I'll go ahead and give you a tip um, you know, before we uh, head back over to see what Matt has for us. My image is, or I'm sorry, my drawing support or surface is seven and a half by 5.4 inches. So if you want to get ready in the next five minutes or so, and you want the, you know, a picture plane that's the same size as mine, that's seven and a half tall by 5.4 inches wide or five and a half inches wide is fine also. All right, and Ashley's going to be leading us through that drawing in just a few minutes. Um, but before we get into that, I'd like to remind you, if you are watching this live on YouTube, of course, you can ask questions or make comments during tonight's broadcast. If you do have a comment or question that's directly, specifically directed at myself or Ashley, if you put in all capital letters, that'll help me see it amongst all the other comments and questions in the chat box, because the chat box does get rolling pretty quick. And while I'll do my best to read all of the small print ones, like everybody telling us where you're from, Indiana, Julian, California, Canary Island, Spain, uh, British Columbia, welcome everybody from all over the world, North Dakota, wherever you are from. But if you do put your comment or question in capital letters, that will help me see it a little bit easier amongst all the other ones, and we'll be sure to address it that way, of course. Now, uh, we're doing Getting Sketchy here. This is a looser approach to creating mm -hmm. a live drawing. These are sketches that we're creating. But if you are interested in taking your drawing and painting skills to another level, I would like to remind you that we have a, a comprehensive program over at thevirtualinstructor.com which includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subject matter and media. We also do weekly live lessons. So uh, Getting Sketchy is going to end pretty soon here on YouTube. We'll take a few weeks before we start a new season, but we'll continue with the live lessons over at thevirtualinstructor.com. These live lessons are complete drawings and paintings. So they go over several weeks. It's a little bit more of an intimate grouping of folks. It's more like a real classroom. Um, and uh, that's part of the program, of course, and all of the recorded lessons uh, from since I started streaming back in 2012 are also part of the program. There are weekly critiques, which are part of the Members Minute, and a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers is also included. Um, all of this is part of the program. All of it's included, and everyone starts out with a week-long trial for free. So if you want to check out our program, uh, there's a link in the description below. You can check it out, of course, at any time. If you want to just dabble a little bit and check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free, you can do that too. There's a link in the description below this video for that as well. Now, Ashley is working from a photo reference tonight, and you'll see that photo reference pop up in just a minute when we switch back over to him. If you want your very own copy of this photo reference, or if you want to use it to follow along, all you have to do is go to the community tab on the YouTube channel. So you might be watching this video, but you might not be on the YouTube channel to do so. To get to the YouTube channel, all you have to do is click on the little icon of my face underneath this video. That will take you to our channel. And uh, while you're there, why don't you go ahead and subscribe? And uh, if you look under the community tab, you will see the photo reference that we're working with tonight. And while you're there, you can look at all the other photo references that we've used from this season of Getting Sketchy. And there's links to all the videos too, so you can go back and watch all the replays. Now, next week will be the last uh, Getting Sketchy for this season. We'll take a few weeks off, and then we'll come back for another season. But next week's episode, we are going to be going through all the drawings that we created this season, and we'll be doing quick critiques of each one of those drawings. Now, that might not seem quite as exciting as creating a drawing from start to finish, but trust me, you will learn a lot from those really many critiques that we are going to do, and you guys are going to be able to uh, chime in too and right. uh, make comments and ask questions as we go through that critique. And Ashley will pick his favorite and I'll pick my favorite from this season as well. And we'll pick the favorites of each other too. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, at this point I've done five drawings. Ashley's done four. He's getting ready to do another one. Real quick, uh, Sandra asks, are you feeling better, Matt? 
Uh, I'm feeling better today, uh, that's for sure. I've got, uh, I, I saw a third doctor the other day, actually an internationally renowned doctor, I didn't realize that, um, who has uh, changed some of the medications for me. Um, so I'm still working my way through recovery. For those of you who don't know, I had, um, I had surgery uh, to remove a rather large kidney stone. And ever since that surgery, I've had some pretty, uh, pretty bad complications, uh, which I have been struggling with for the past three months. Uh, you probably wouldn't know it. Uh, some of you don't know it. Only the people who are, are, are part of our membership program really knows it. But that's what I've been dealing with. But I am feeling better. I'm getting better and I'm going to be completely better soon. So that's right. Um, anyway, uh, I've got a, a question already and we'll address that question, Barbara, in just a minute. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Ashley. So, are you ready to go? I'll just yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's bring talk about up the our main supplies camera here. All right, you can see the reference on the left there, and um, there's a lot going on in there. But we do have a grid to help us. It's an unusual looking grid because it is um, rectangular, horizontal rectangles on a vertical uh, reference, a vertical rectangle. But we'll go ahead and talk about how easy it is to use a grid like this. This is my special half seas grid. So um, you can see on my paper, I, I do have already a picture plane laid out. Let me bring that down just a touch. There we go. And so um, just to reiterate, we're seven and a half inches tall and 5.4 inches wide and uh, the difference between 5.4 and five and a half is negligible so you can go seven and a half by five and a half and you really won't see any distortion um, noticeable distortion in your drawing all right so I want to draw with I'm going to be drawing with charcoal let's go ahead and take a look at that I've got vine charcoal a couple of sticks of that it's porous um, they're a little crooked because they're pretty natural and I also have a broken stick of compressed charcoal. Of course, I'll be using the sharp ends of those, um, possibly. Um, we'll see. We won't need much of the compressed charcoal because there's not a whole lot of solid black um, in this image. So we'll do most of it with the vine charcoal. Plus, um, vine charcoal is great for sketching because it's so loose. Uh, it's very easy to remove. And remember, this program is about sketching. So we'll use the vine charcoal mostly. I also have a stump. Um, I plan is to just sort of put in some shapes, broad shapes of value, and then start kind of painting with it and sliding it and moving it around. And as we move it around, I'm sure we'll get too dark in areas. Um, so that's where our kneaded eraser comes in. And I've been over here warming up this kneaded eraser for about 10 minutes while Matt was talking. I want to show you his, Matt's kneaded eraser is out on the table, so I'll show you his. So they're, you know, one's dark and one's light. Matt's is just more used than mine. So if you've got a kneaded eraser, it doesn't matter if it's new and light gray or, or dark. Sometimes I like them when they get dark. They don't erase as much. And they make some in color too. Yeah, that's true. They make orange and blue and green ones. And that's a great way not to get yours mixed up with other people. So um, you can get a colored one if you'd like to. But I like to kind of warm them up and squeeze them a little bit before I start drawing with them. I also have... A pink pearl eraser. This one's a little hard. It may be old, but I think it'll do. And then I have the electric eraser. I plan to use that. There's a few areas where there's really narrow highlights. So I'll bring out the electric eraser later in the drawing. Of course, you can do the same thing with any sh um, sharp edge on an eraser, like the edge of an eraser cap. You can use something like that to make sharp erased lines as well. Um, I do have an eraser shield, and I don't know if we'll use it or need it, but sometimes I like to use the eraser shield to kind of clean up light areas against d hard, dark edges, and we do have some of those in the shadows. So I might use the eraser shield, and if I do, and you don't have one, um, you could probably just use like some sort of a piece of paper or card. That would work just as well. All right, so we'll see if we use all of these tools, but at least we have them to use as we need them. All right, I think it's okay. about time to uh, get started. Got a hello from Poland, a hello from Australia. All right. Thanks for joining us, guys. I know it's probably not convenient, uh, <laughs> time-wise, to join us live. Barbara asked, what do you use to fix your charcoal and pencil drawings as I go ahead and start the timer. Yeah, go ahead timer. and start the timer, and I'm going to I'm gonna start with the actual grid. So as long as if you have a picture plane that's the same proportion as, your, as our reference, um, then you can just sort of find the approximate halfway points and draw a loose line through there. Keep it as straight as you, as you can, but it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm going to keep mine really light, and um, it's a little wiggly. I've made it with charcoal so that I'll be able to erase it. So the whole drawing's in charcoal tonight, no pencil. You can use pencil if you'd like. And as Ashley's um, plotting that out, I, I think you might have missed that question. 
Um, I'll go ahead and tell you, I don't really fix my tra charcoal drawings or pencil drawings at all. I don't even fix my pastel drawings. I just keep them in a drawer with a cover sheet. But if you are going to fix them, there are lots of different reputable brands of fixative to use out there. Uh, Grumbacher, Winsor & Newton um, are fabulous uh, choices. The one thing that I would I would caution you on spray fixing your your artwork, which is one of the reasons why I don't do it anymore, is if they're um, if you're not careful, if you don't spray a little bit before you put it on there, sometimes it can splatter out on your artwork. And uh, once you have a splatter mark with fixative, it's there forever. Yeah, you uh, want to test that nozzle out for sure, especially if it's not brand new. You know, it'll clog yeah. up a little bit in there. But I, I use the Grumbacher um, fixative with my charcoal and pencil drawings, mostly just charcoal, but I use it really lightly. So it probably doesn't do much good, just really light coat. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to go ahead and start in dark areas. And right here, um, incidentally, I had better put a plus sign in, basically just split the composition in half vertically and horizontally. And then I split the top half horizontally and the bottom half horizontally and it gives us our eight blocks. And I'm going to start right here where there's a sort of a dark shape on the back of a column. And uh, we're going to start without really any details, just looking at large shapes of, uh, of value, just the darker areas first. And Susan is asking, what was the name of the grid again? Half grid? I call it the half Z's grid. That's a word I've made up. So it's just the half I guess the halfway grid just yeah. uh, basically we end up with rectangles that are in proportion to our support in this case they're turned 90 degrees but they're still pretty much in proportion all right let's keep yeah. it loose doesn't matter what you call it Looks yeah it doesn't like matter what just, you call it just it's, halfing the grid it's not made of squares or halfing the, the picture plane right and that's then the main it thing again. not um, really made of squares all right, looks like we're going to come down through this grid line, not in the center, but just to the right of center for the darker edge of our arch. Kathy asks, what type of paper is this? Um, that's a great question. This is Strathmore drawing paper, and it is 100 pound paper out of my son's sketchbook. Okay, so pretty much just regular drawing yeah, paper. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's, it's good pretty paper. bad it's when nice a working heavy. artist has to steal sketchbook paper from his son's sketchbook. <laughs> I know. I know. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll buy you that sketchbook. That's nice paper. And Frankie, I saw I'll your use question a little bit of that. earlier. 22 Frankie 11 said, how long will it take me to become a pro, to draw like a pro? I only have YouTube videos as my guide. Well, 22 Frankie 11, I got to tell you that it, that is up to you, really, how long it's going to be. And it's going to be different for everybody, too. Um, I will tell you the amount of practice you put in will directly correlate with how quickly you improve. Uh, so the more that you practice, the the more you're going to improve. It's that simple. But it needs to be practice that actually helps improve your drawing. In other words, if you spent all of your time just drawing from imagination, uh, meaning not looking at any reference material, whether it be live reference material or, or photographs, then you're probably not going to get much better at drawing. Um, you probably won't see a lot of improvement. You'll probably come up with wonderful creative ideas, but drawing representationally anyway is all about observation. So you have to practice observing things. And to do that, you need to have some reference material, whether it's a photograph or even better drawing something from life. So uh, the more you draw from observation, it really doesn't matter what it is the quicker you're going to get better at drawing. And uh, the folks who can draw really well from imagination are the ones who have spent a lot of times drawing from observation because you can build up kind of uh, some, some memory. It's like a library of forms and shapes and, and colors that you can, right. can pull from and reuse at, at will. Right. So focus your attention on drawing from observation. And you've got stuff all around you that you can observe and draw. I bet if you just uh, looked at some of the things on your desk, those are excellent, excellent subjects for drawing. I'm assuming that you have normal things that normal people have on their desk, <laughs> like uh, staplers, pencils, pens. Oh, I love to draw the swing line stapler. In fact, that's the object I've drawn the most um, as a blind contour object. It's a great blind contour. Yeah, the contour. stapler was my favorite blind contour yeah, yeah. Blind subject. Um, anyway, um, or it can be, you know, things that you see in, uh, you know, around you in photographs or whatever. But um, just the more, the more you practice from observation, the better you're going to get and the quicker you're going to get. And I can't tell you a timeline exactly how long it's going to take you to get better because some people 
learn quicker based on the amount of practice that they put into it. Um, and some people are a little bit slower with that, and that's fine, uh, just as long as you're continuing to practice. So some people are going to improve faster than others, and that's pretty much the way it is with any skill out there. Because drawing and painting are skills, and skills can be really attained by anyone. They can be developed. That's right. All right, we got a hello from the Philippines, uh, North Carolina, and Montana. All right. Another person from North Carolina. Um, Edie says, I found that spray fixative can blow away some of the pigment particles and turn some of the rest transparent. Yeah, anytime you add something to your artwork, and that's what you're doing when you're putting a fixative on there, there is some chances of um, some, some alterations that can happen to your artwork, obviously. So uh, you do have to be mindful that uh, fixative uh, is going to be an, an, an additive. It's something that you're adding to your artwork. And the, another reason why I don't like to use the fixative anymore um, is because I've noticed that it makes, it changes the values, uh, especially in the pastel artwork. Yeah, it'll dark. Oh, yeah. I can just tell more in pastel mm -hmm. than in, uh, in the charcoal. The charcoal just makes it a little extra, a little higher contrast. And that's kind of nice, actually. Yeah, it can be. Uh, hello from Buffalo. Hello from the UK. I hope everyone is doing fantastic tonight we're still working on just getting um, material down right now just mostly hitting the darker areas leaving the mid-tones alone and we'll drag our charcoal around to address those mid-tones now i did some photoshop work to this image i cropped it down it's originally from pixabay and um the the part of the building that's in the background um i tried to lighten that i tried to push the atmospheric perspective and make what's further away um, much lighter. But then I wasn't getting any good contrast between the center column and the building that's in the background. So I, then I went the other way. I took the building in the back and brought it down so that it was just a little bit darker and reduced its contrast. So um, the building that's farther away or the part of the building that's farther away has less of a value range. And that's supposed to help push it back in space compared to the portion of the building that's in front of us. So let's go ahead and address that big shape in there for right now it's just a, i'm just going to think of of what looks to be a concrete trash can and uh, and then also the building in the background i'm just going to think about that as one big solid shape right now now wonderful thing about charcoal is it's so easily manipulated all of this can be easily erased and taken off um, and it can be moved around on the surface of course especially since he's using uh, the vine uh, charcoal yeah, and we'll, Susan is asking is that vine charcoal and um, yeah it's vine charcoal yeah and we'll probably stick mostly with vine maybe just some accent marks with the compressed charcoal tonight we've got another user from the UK and also someone from Malaysia I'm glad, glad to see you guys uh, we also have a hello from Hong Kong all right great to see so many people from all over the world isn't it great that we can be connected here together and um, we can draw together, yeah. or at least watch Ashley draw together. Pretty futuristic. <laughs> Pretty futuristic. Um, a hello from Thailand as well. Great to have all you guys. So here is um, an example of what you can do with charcoal that you really can't, you probably shouldn't do with graphite. No. Nope. Um, you can see he's ignoring all of the details on the building and just thinking about the shape filling in that shape with some pretty loose gestural marks with the charcoal and then here comes the blending stop. that's right so i didn't totally cover the paper because i you know i wanted it to be a lighter slightly lighter gray than the marks that were going down so i left a little white showing through so that uh the gray that we sort of smudge out here will be a bit lighter and we can go in, we can choose how much um, detail we put in different areas. Of course, backgrounds can always have less detail than foregrounds, less than we can even see. Um, but we'll choose how much we put in, and uh, time will be a factor. Alana says, feeling disobedient, was struggling with controlling the Von Charcoal, so I'm drawing the outline with graphite, not shading it. Now, listen, I, I will tell you that um, the some of the advantages of charcoal just like with any drawing or painting medium, there are advantages and disadvantages. But sometimes the the advantages are also found in what many people would be considered a disadvantage. So let me explain what I mean. All right, let's hear. Um, charcoal is so easy to move around on the surface, 
and it's easy to erase, it's easy to manipulate, but because it's easy to manipulate, it is also perceived as being messy and hard to control. But if it didn't have those wonderful characteristics, um, then it wouldn't behave the way that charcoal, only charcoal can behave. So um, you, you kind of have to embrace the messiness a little bit. I don't know if you can see on the paper, there's some s s smudges. It's all Look over at Ashley's hands, hands already. We're just getting yeah, started. He's not, he, and he's actually taking a very controlled approach Wait, of using it, this charcoal. This drawing is so small. It is. You know, <laughs> usually when I make charcoal drawings, they're 24 inches tall almost minimum. I think of it as a big medium that I want to get my arm in. So I went as big as we really could with the studio and the camera, um, but uh, I'm trying to be as careful as I can. But it is it can be pretty loose because it is kind of large. So so with charcoal, don't don't try to overly control it. It's, I, And I've explained this several times in the past, uh, especially with charcoal, this is true. If you've ever made anything out of clay, you usually start with a ball of clay. And that ball of clay is not the finished results, obviously. You have to start moving it around. You have to start kneading the clay. And slowly you're forming something out of that ball of clay. But it's a process. You can't expect to just make one mash or one indentation and then be at your final result. It's a process of molding it, moving it around. And sometimes you might move a part and then you have to go back and remove it again. Um, and that's, that's a part of the process of sculpting with clay. Well, with charcoal, we can we can find a correlation because sometimes you'll put down a bit of the material and it'll smudge and it'll get messed up and you have to go back and, um, you know, attend to, to those areas again. Yeah, that's true. We constantly mess up what we've already done. It gives us a chance to go back and when we do that, we refine it. usually get a little closer than we were the first time. Right. It, just like molding the clay, um, you're, and you'll see Ashley's going to use the eraser in this in this drawing, I'm sure, um, oh, yeah. and the charcoal is so easy to erase that the eraser uh, obviously becomes a mark making tool in itself. Um, so there's a lot of freedom in that in that medium. There's a lot of freedom in charcoal, freedom to make mistakes, freedom to experiment because it is hard to control. Um, so hopefully what I said makes sense. So it's a little bit paradoxical, <laughs> I guess, but one of the best uh, attributes of charcoal is also one of the attributes that people find frustrating. I like to think of charcoal as the original drawing medium. Yeah, and another thing about charcoal is it, it's a great drawing medium to help you transition into opaque painting, um, like painting with acrylics or oils, uh, because it is it is charcoal and pastels are definitely the most painterly drawing media out there. Yeah, because they sl they move around easily, and that's what our paint does. It's easy to blend with and to scrape off, just like charcoal is easy to. Um, smudge and erase okay uh paul's got an interesting comment here all right maybe you can help me decipher it if not for the process how could we call ourselves artists even hobby artists not for the process the how process of making the art yeah now paul i'm i'm gonna I'm going to talk, I'm going to answer here with something probably crazy i, I wrote an article on the blog uh years ago um you, you know, examining art education, because that's the background that really both of us come from. And um, we, there's kind of a, an idea in art education, or a little bit of a de debate on which is more important, uh, process or product. That's true. And there are art teachers that focus on the product. And a lot of times for those art teachers, you'll see, you know, when they'll have an exhibit, um, and we see this a lot really clearly with elementary teachers, where all of the projects look very similar and you can tell that the teacher walked the student through the process as would be expected at that right. level um know. yeah and in and in the end the product is really what's important to the art teacher and that's that's basically a product based project this is what i like to call those projects because you're you're just making you're going through the process and you're making a project and again you can really tell the teachers who teach this way because all of their projects look the same all you know they're very similar um, but then there are teachers who focus on process and those teachers they're not really concerned with the end result or the product instead they're focused more on the process and the, the students learning the process more and there's a 
a project that I used to do uh, when I taught students called a uh, highlight rendering. I called it highlight rendering, but basically the process was in charcoal and the students covered the entire sheet of paper, an 18 by 24 sheet of drawing paper with charcoal and then used a chamois um, or their hands even uh, to just work all of that charcoal into the paper so that the surface was actually just a gray. Then they used kneaded erasers and other erasers to erase out the highlights only. Then they would go back with vine charcoal and compressed charcoal to render some of the shadowed areas. Now, as you might imagine, I did this project with Art One students. And as you might imagine, um, first of all, the room was incredibly <laughs> dirty after having three or four Art One classes in a day, um, having all that charcoal everywhere. It but would, we would have charcoal underneath our nose <laughs> just from breathing. Right. Just from breathing. Yeah, I would so go much home of it. and have black so nostrils. Much, right. So much of it in the air. Um, anyway, it probably harmed me. Oh, Pro yeah. Probably. Yeah. Uh, Several years of our life is today. gone. <laughs> anyway. Um, there were lots of students that obviously struggled with that project as far as the product goes because it was usually their first time using charcoal. I was making them use an eraser as a mark making tool and the room was dark because I had a still life set up in the middle of the room with a strong light source and charcoal was messy and dusty. And you know what? The whole point of that project was not necessarily to have a, a final product. Although some students did really well and created excellent products, the, the point of that project was for the students to learn the process and more importantly, the concept that I was trying to teach. And I was trying to teach them value. This is when we talked about value, value the darkness or lightness of color. It's one of the seven elements of art. And by covering the paper first with a layer of gray, you start in the middle of the value scale. And then you use the kneaded eraser to, to remove the tints. Then you use the vine charcoal and compressed charcoal to add the shades. So you're creating a full range of value. And honestly, as a ninth grader or a, a beginning student, an, an art one student, I really wasn't concerned with the product. I was concerned with the process and the concept I was mm -hmm. trying to teach the student. And my philosophy as a teacher has always been to focus on the process or the concept, because if you do that as an art teacher, then eventually the products will, will that, that the product part of that will take care of itself. Once the students know the concepts, they know the processes, then the products speak for themselves and they do so in a very unique artistic way. Our students created artworks uh, as juniors and seniors based on what they learned as freshmen and sophomores that were unique as artists that were, you know, they weren't cookie cutter. They were creating products that were uniquely right. theirs. We would make an assignment, but when you hung them up together, you couldn't necessarily tell that the assignment was uh, singular. That they, exactly. they, didn't, they had the same objective, but it was more about using the elements and principles of art, not about um, recreating a, a certain subject. And their subjects were their choice, and that's how they spoke. That exactly. That's where their voice came from. Yeah, definitely. So hopefully everybody understands what I'm talking about. So if you're an art teacher and you're watching this, I hope you're focusing on process, because what you'll notice is um, if you focus on product, you'll end up with a bunch of students who think that art is just a step-by-step -step process and uh, don't really have a lot of creative freedom or creativity in the art that they create. But if you focus on process, then what you'll end up with is students who are educated in what it takes to create a piece of artwork, and that gives them the freedom to create their own artworks as their own unique artists that they are. Um, hopefully all of that uh, makes sense. So in my mind, when we're talking about uh, art education, the process is the most important part. But when you're talking about being a professional artist and producing artwork, then there the product is clearly mo more important than the process. So, um, and, and you'll, you'll see this because I, I'm not really uh, opposed to artists using tracings or transfers as long as the finished result is, um, you know, a quality product that is artistically presented. Um, and people will, will disagree with that. But if you're a professional artist and you're doing, let's say, a portrait of someone who, a portrait who is easily recognizable by lots of people, uh, you could, of course, you know, drive yourself crazy, make sure the proportions are correct and working on that part of the mouth that isn't just right um, for hours and hours and hours until you get it right. Or you can, um, you know, transfer some of that information so that you have a, a, 
a level of base information uh, on which to proceed from. Because obviously in those situations, the product is more important. You don't want to be hired to do uh, a portrait of someone for some, for, for example, and then the portrait not look like the person. Sure. Um, so you, as a professional artist, you'll do pretty much anything you can to make sure that your product is successful. So I know you're asking, if not for the process, how could we call ourselves artists? Um, you can call your, if you create anything, if you make anything, you are an artist. Now there are differences between good and bad artists, obviously, but if you, if you make anything, you are an artist, you can call yourself an artist. You know, it's funny. You talked about being focused on the process with your younger students, you know, your mm -hmm. lower level students. But in the past few years, um, I, you know, I teach AP art courses in high school. And in the past few years, what AP has been asking to see is more process oriented. You know, they want to see sketchbook pages mm -hmm. in your portfolio. They want to see um, pictures of you actually physically making the work or what that space looks like, how you're, you know, they want to really see um, the process as well. And my students are scored on that. And it's really been a blessing because not only do we not have to produce as much finished artwork to fill the portfolio, um, but it's a better reflection of, of, of who they are as artists. Exactly. And so they, I think their scores are better and they're not under as much pressure just to produce, but to instead continuously revise and make decisions. You know, revising is a big part of the artistic process. And a lot of times their sketchbook pages show where they've changed their mind about their approach. And um, that seems to be what is uh, it's kind of getting attention and scoring well nowadays. So I'm, I like to see that. I think it's a positive change in art education. All right, we've got a lot of material down now. I'm looking for the shadows. Still working with mostly shapes. We've still got 20. We're only halfway through the drawing. So um, we'll be able to go back and start refining and working on our edges and finding some details in the background. We've almost got the bulk of our charcoal um, blocked in at least blocked in and that's another great thing about charcoal is it's uh, it can be a quicker medium you can get a lot of information yeah, down very you quickly get it down fast okay he is asking what's apr please did we ap art is oh a yeah i get it now yeah. I, now that i read it out loud yeah I had to, <laughs> it's it means advanced placement so it's uh it's a high those are high school level art courses um that students uh, submit portfolios from at the end of the school year to an organization called College Board. And those portfolios are scored. And if the score is high enough, they can choose to um, use the class for college credit. Now, a lot of my students don't use it for college credit because they're going into art education. I'm sorry, they're going into art fields, you know, or art majors or design majors. And they don't really want to skip art classes, but uh, you can do that. And it's funny, you heard, you heard what I said, but it's, Edie is asking, what is A.P.R. taught? So she heard it as an acronym um, instead of AP art. Oh, yeah. She heard APR. <laughs> um, and I'm I understand sorry. that. Um, so it's it, the AP stands for advanced placement and we're saying art instead of the letter r but i know with r. our accents it probably sounds r. Like r um and um anyway and somebody else had answered that there uh, paul says indeed a solid portfolio is crucial and its development needs to be taught more i suppose and yeah if any students Definitely. are watching this i can give you some hints on your portfolio some colleges and universities want very specific things and that will be spelled out to them or spelled out in their requirements but if they're asking for a general portfolio what i would suggest is eight to ten pieces if you don't have ten incredibly strong pieces then stick with eight and the best piece of artwork in your portfolio needs to be the first piece of artwork in your portfolio and the second best piece of artwork needs to be the last piece of art in your portfolio mm, that's and good the, the theory behind that is that people are you know influenced by their first impression and then their last impression of a person so if you organize your portfolio in that way uh, you're gonna you're gonna create hopefully you're going to have a little bit more of a uh, a better response to the portfolio so again if you have eight pieces let's say the number one piece of art should be first number two should be 
the last, and then the second one should be the third best, and the next to last should be the fourth best, and so on, so that your least successful pieces are in the middle of the portfolio, uh, because that's usually when uh, there's probably less attention paid to the artwork. So just a little bit of uh, psychology included in there. Not not guaranteed to work, but it's, hey, that's what I've always advised my students in the past to think about when they're putting their portfolio together. And, you know, the number one comment my students come back with when they go to colleges for, you know, portfolio reviews, and these aren't the AP portfolios. These are just sort of general um, portfolios, like Matt mentioned, completed artworks. But the number one suggestion they get is you need more work from life in here. You need more work from life. Now, I know we draw from photos here on Getting Sketchy, um, but uh, drawing from life is where you develop a lot of those ar observational skills, and we're using those even with photographs. There's just more tricks to observe um, without the grid in the photograph. So more observational drawing for those of you looking to put together college portfolios. And uh, undertow underscore uh -oh. nine 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 just gave us uh -oh. a super chat. Yeah. Super chat. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Yeah. What was the comment? Hello. Thanks for the stream. Thanks for the stream. Super. So just just a quick thanks there. Thank you so much. Uh, undertow underscore nine nine nine. We appreciate it. We definitely do. All right, we've reached the point in the drawing where we have something everywhere. It's just we need to get darker in places like over here and then start um, sort of sharpening up edges and working on details. And we've got about 18 minutes for that. So I'm going to focus on darker first. We need to get them into some of these values um, further down the uh, value scale. You know, value is more important than any other element of art and definitely uh, more important when you're creating space than our um, details. And we're creating space. This drawing's about space. It's got a lot of perspective in it. Um, and then, of course, it's got sort of a foreground and a background, even though they're pretty close together. So I th I've likened this drawing as being about value and space mostly. Space, space, space. Mm -hmm. Space, of course, is one of the seven elements of art, too. It's my favorite element of art. Is it? Yep, okay. my favorite one. Not as important as value, but it's my favorite. Do you have a favorite element of art? I yeah. Mean, yeah. Is it value? It's value. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Some people are In fact, lying. one of my early videos Some on YouTube, are shape. I can't remember what it was. It's either drawing an eye or drawing a nose or something mm -hmm. like that. People made comments underneath uh, the video on how many times I said value and... <laughs> We're, you know, I, they were playing a little game. Well, I don't know if they were playing a game or not. Uh, a, a lot of the people were talking about how they didn't like that I said value so much. <laughs> but, you know, it's just uh, it's just the way it is. If if value is so important, and you're using value to create the illusion in, in a drawing. Uh, then you do have to repeat it. A I lot know of there times. are there is art that's not heavily dependent on value, like a. Like we mentioned John Lennon last week, his his <laughs> narrow, thin line drawings. That's contrast in value. Yeah, but it, there's still contrast. Yeah. I mean, black lines show up against the white paper. So right. value is still required even yep. when it's not playing uh, a central role. That's why it's so – that's what makes it feel important. Oh, yeah. Eventually, we got to get down to where we just barely touch the paper sometimes when we work with charcoal because it is so delicate. I'm trying to do more mark making and a little less sort of drawing. I don't know if that makes sense. They're kind of synonymous, but just using marks that come together but don't necessarily, um, their contours don't always match up the way they would if we could see entirely um, this scene completely clearly because some of it's obscured. It's in the shadows. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I think uh, drawing with charcoal is so related to, to painting with an opaque medium. You have to you have to think about those shapes of of value instead of like uh, in more of a linear fashion. Right. Like, you can't really draw lines and then fill them in. Right. You know, like right. we can with many other media. All right. Let's get in this background a little bit. Start finding some marks back there. Keep we'll keep it kind of loose. I'm just looking to look for some of those darker marks. I could see I could see where one of my grid lines used to be. And that's helpful because there's a dark mark that comes right off of that grid line. So I'm going to follow that across. 
until I hit the column on the left and then draw part of one of these uh, roof lines. Looks like it comes down to and just past the point of the roof edge that's above it. So you can see Ashley's making comparisons as he's adding more info, more visual information. He's making comparisons with what visual information he's already got on the surface. And that's more how we work when we don't have a grid anyway. Mm -hmm. So we're doing both of those things all the time. Using the grid and using the information that's already in the drawing. And you know, this is a really good example of a subject that uh, you could map out using two point perspective. Yeah. And I even thought about um, drawing a diagram to look at before yeah. we started. I've done, done that before. But you don't have to, you know, a lot of times people think that you're drawing a pain or you're, you're drawing a building. Uh, well, let's break out the rulers. And I like to draw that way, but we don't have to, don't we have can just to. kind of cap measure these angles just capture them and move them over to our artwork even if we don't realize or know where the point is that they would actually come from but it is helpful to kind of keep that in the back of your mind so yeah. you can check your work uh, yeah. make sure that it's, the angles are it's are definitely close to being correct. worth studying linear perspective just so that you hold it in your mind while you work just like studying anatomy you know it's not required for drawing um, people to understand what's underneath the skin but it can be nice to know i'd say it like that all right and we've got some dark arches back there it's all about the arches that sounds like netflix's next series dark arches <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks for the thumbs up there henrique and if if you are enjoying this video i'll remind you give it a like I've got a little while. That'll help other people who like to draw and paint like yourself on this video. Um, and Jazz W is asking, is it Willow? Well, Willow Charcoal, charcoal. and Vine Charcoal are very, um, they're almost indiscriminate. In this, I can't tell you because I don't have the package. Yeah. So when you hear someone say Vine Charcoal or Willow Charcoal, they're, they're pretty much yeah, the same. Yeah, I, I always say Vine Charcoal, even if it's a Willow Charcoal, because just because that's the first box I used. And so it's kind of like the word um, Kleenex for tissue. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. I know Vine isn't a name brand, but it just uh And Vine Charcoal, I think, like comes it. from Great Vines and that's Willow. Right comes from the willow tree yeah um and I, th I think you know those woods are are probably pretty similar in reality so it doesn't it's not surprising that uh the charcoal version uh, of the two are very similar uh, which one is harder do you do you know i don't have any clue i think one is slightly harder than the other but it's it's so i mean sometimes where sometimes <laughs> you can see uh let me check what i've got here where a stem has been broken off of the of the willow or vine charcoal, you can see a little a little mm -hmm. mark, and uh, sometimes you hit a hard spot in there, and I just snap that piece off and keep going. It's um, unusually hard, but I don't know if one of them is is like consistently harder than the other. It's a good question. All right, so um, we put the arches in real loose. You know, I just made kind of a curve, and then uh, and then just um, dragged my charcoal down a little bit. We're going to do that up on the next level as well. And it's okay. You know, it's really tiny marks in here for such a medium. And, um, Okay, ED points out at first it looked flat, but now it's looking more and more 3D. And that's because good, good. there is uh, the range of value is getting broader. Yeah, and we're we're taking some of those bigger flat shapes, like what was in the background, and just by stretching these diagonal lines across from it, that indicates space. Diagonals indicate space because um, horizontals are turned to diagonals when they're above or below our eyes, and we're used to seeing that when we walk around in the world. And, and Paul, so, Paul asked what paper is being used in this piece, and it's a 100-pound drawing paper that Ashley confiscated from his son's <laughs> sketchbook so that's right um, <laughs> and it's uh, made by strathmore there is plenty of paper here in the studio <laughs> uh, but ashley insists on stealing paper from his son well i've got some white paper but i, I this i really like this you know he bought that sketchbook saying well it's pretty good paper <laughs> i'm gonna keep using that uh, michelle says it's looking great thank you thank you michelle you know, it's there's just so much in here. We just uh, we sketch until we're out of time, and that's just where we're at with this one. 
Okay, so I've just got a real subtle value change between the two sides or two planes of the top of that, uh, the tallest part of our building. Just that'll help just get in a corner in there. It'll indicate a little more space. And you got some. I think uh, most of you guys are noticing that, uh, that if you remember that analogy I used earlier about molding the clay, as, as he continues to work on this and add and subtract things, that's what's making it start to look a little bit more like the subject. I mean, you can see I'm not carefully drawing out like arch shapes. I'm just putting in marks, just little marks where those would go. And we can, we can try to shape them a little bit with our stump. Just like sometimes um, when we're painting, or when I'm painting anyway, a detail can be so small, I just can't make the mark small enough. So I'll paint a larger mark, a blob, if you will, and then, um, and then shape it from there. Oh, oop, I've lost some of my drawing over here, so I'm going to work to bring it back. And very gradually, I'll stop touching it so much, and hopefully uh, this vine or willow charcoal will stop rubbing off. In fact, I almost made a bridge out of a, uh, a ruler to bring tonight, just to give my hand something to rest on. And I'm really wishing I had done that now. All right. So we just soften the edge of our shadow again. Okay. Oh, we just got a super chat. All from right, Enrique. Enrique, thank you so much. That's for awesome. That. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you. Love those super chats. All right, I think I'm gonna, mm, let me get a little darker over here still. You know, 90% of my advice in the classroom is make that darker. And that's most of the advice I give myself while I draw as well. Another thing right. that's important about this particular image is the light, the, the contrasting shapes of where we see light in the sky and in that courtyard and coming yeah, through get, and then the shadows. Two light shapes up here and then a few light shapes down here yep. to try to balance it out. It's kind of a play between the two parts. Henrique says, great live streams. Thanks so much again. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you for being here watching okay jazz w wants you to, to to break out the electric eraser Did you oh yeah no I, I tested it over here just a little bit <laughs> okay what are we down to about six minutes yeah six we'll be minutes. breaking that out now okay i think i want to get I think Paul is joking here, but he says going to flea markets is good for figuring out what type of works are selling best. <laughs> Maybe you'll find the dogs playing poker. Yeah. The flea market. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been to a flea market. As long as I don't go to the flea market and find my most recent painting there, I won't be upset. <laughs> uh, Margaret says, I love charcoal. My first love course was the ostrich that's one of our live uh, lesson series i think i named the ostrich bertie because she looked like she was bertie um, she but she's saying loved him <laughs> he gets best spot on my wall oh very good uh -huh. I'm glad that you uh went through that and enjoyed it and uh, created something that you're proud of uh, and in that series we worked on gray paper and uh, used both white charcoal and black charcoal Oh, 
Oh, I think right. that drawing took us maybe five hours. Maybe it's five lessons, if I remember correctly. So this drawing, of course, is just 45 minutes and much smaller. Oh, yeah. In fact, yeah, I would like it to be larger. And I didn't, but you know, I could have drawn with pencils, um, charcoal pencils, but uh, I wanted to stick with our classic, kind of our classic sticks. Okay, Edie asked, what kind of marketing do you guys do offline, please? And Edie, I actually don't take commissions anymore um, unless it's a very special circumstance. Uh, because the website and the art education that I provide is my full-time gig. And um, I think Ashley's kind of the same way. Ashley, do you market your art anymore? I know you were um, in a gallery at, at not, one point. Not a whole lot, but I'm thinking about starting again. But as far as marketing yourself, um, what I would suggest doing in today's environment uh, there are a couple of routes you could go of course you could go the more traditional route where you try to find someone to represent you whether that's a gallery or an art agent or something like that mm -hmm. um, and they do the marketing that's kind of old school nowadays because we have such uh, such wonderful technology here in the internet where you can market yourself I would start uh, a website or a blog make sure that you have a website or a blog where you can talk about your process of creating art and also where you can showcase your art i think that would be step number one it's so easy to create a website these days there's really no reason why if you want to be a professional artist you don't have a website so that would be step number one then you can do things like you can have a youtube channel like we have here uh, where you detail the process of making your art or you talk about some of the artworks that you create you can also build up a social media presence on facebook and instagram of course and you can also create a store like a, an etsy store to sell your artwork too that's also highly effective uh, so those are some some great places to start um, again if you go the more traditional route where you're represented by a, a gallery uh, they may have they may not want you to do some of those things i'm not really sure um, but in today's age I, I really feel like if you're if the art that you're creating is quality then you shouldn't have much of a, a difficult time finding buyers um, now as far as etsy goes um, i do think that um, you know some of those etsy creators are investing in advertising with etsy um, and of course you might need to do some of that advertising as well to get things rolling. Um, but if your artwork is strong and it appeals to a broad spectrum of people, then there's no reason why you can't be, uh, you know, successful selling your artwork online. So hopefully that's what you were asking there, Edie. Um, it really is the, the landscape of being an artist has changed so dramatically in the last 20 years. Um, that uh, really I would encourage most people to go the the modern route <laughs> where you're an advocate for yourself because then you don't have to worry about uh, galleries taking a commission which sometimes can be pretty hefty but on uh, you know some some art some um, artist agents are a little bit better in terms of their cut than a gallery and there's more opportunity for licensing because that's what a lot of them mm -hmm. are looking for is licensing yep. opportunities. So it can be a little more lucrative, I think. Uh, but there are some folks who, who want to buy their artwork exclusively from specific galleries. So um, that's something they can. So that's probably going to be the, um, there's probably not going to be many people that fall into that category. Now, it is easy to get yourself out there, and it's easier than it used to be, but also because it is so easy um, that you got to remember that there's going to be a lot of competition out there, too. So you need to think about Good ways point. that you can set yourself apart from, from the crowd. Uh, maybe that's through your style, your process, your pricing. Uh, there are lots of different ways to differentiate yourself, but you have to think about yourself as being a business if you're going to be a successful uh, artist. As for, and what I mean by successful is that you're you're a, you're, uh, it's lucrative for you to be an artist. Uh, there's lots of artists out there that I don't really necessarily care for their artwork that are um, 
that are lucrative. Um, and uh, you know, so uh, there's been lots of great artists throughout history who have uh, not necessarily found themselves in the position of uh, being able to support themselves. All you know, marketing. We all know, we all all know Van Gogh. We all know the story of Van Gogh. So uh, you have to be able to market yourself. Poor, poor Vincent. All right. Well, I know the time's up. And, and Jan H has uh, makes a good point. Uh, just be careful about putting all of your marketing eggs into the same social media baskets. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. You need to go where your your potential clients are going to be. Um, so you need to think about your target audience. That's a good point. Um, Savic says, what paper do you recommend for charcoal beginners? Love from Serbia. Well, love back to you here from the U.S. Well, um, actual charcoal, I mean, for drawing paper is great for beginners. It's probably going to be cheaper than actual charcoal paper. So I would stick with sketch and regular drawing paper in the beginning um, while you make your first hundred drawings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a, a paper called charcoal paper. That helps control the charcoal a little bit. Um, it has what's called a laid pattern on it, so it's a it's a patterned paper that has uh, a little bit of a tooth associated with it. A traditional drawing paper like Ashley's using here has a weaker tooth, so the charcoal is a little bit harder to control. But as you can see, the charcoal still works just fine on this paper. Um, but uh, the charcoal paper might be beneficial if you're kind of a little bit worried about the charcoal making a big mess. And you can find charcoal paper usually at any big box art store. Uh, and of course, you can order it online as well. The charcoal paper um, is a little bit off white too. So it's kind of, it's similar to the colored paper that Ashley's working on tonight. You can kind of see the edge of the white board and the edge of the, the paper and you can kind of see a contrast there. All right. Well, I guess this one is just about wrapped wrapped up for the uh, the time that we have. Awesome. And it looks so, great. Thank you. I'd like to wish I had 45 more minutes, but I guess we can talk more about that next week when we critique these. Yeah. Well, you can imagine if Ashley continued to work and push the pull, push and pull, like I like to say, the light and dark values, you can see how much he could bring it to uh, really a more accurate depiction of the subject. But, but this is how I like to like to work you know just try to spread out a lot of shapes and then just start um um sort of uh fine tuning from there start that process instead of looking for um, finished parts from the very beginning and uh in the beginning you talked about how you wanted to create the illusion of space there or space was an important element in this image and you definitely can feel the space it almost feels like you could walk up those steps and walk walk right out that opening into that little courtyard into there, the so. courtyard and that's right um, Jan also says, also Instagram, et cetera, may overnight kick you out without cause. That's very true. Or change <laughs> to become TikTok. Yeah. Those are properties that you do not own. Um, that's why it's important to have your own website. And also, I didn't mention this, but also build up a mailing list. Uh, you can use a service like MailChimp to start collecting emails and uh, get folks on that email list. So whenever you create a new piece of artwork, you have a group of people you can send it out to um, and potentially find a buyer that way. Oh, that's um, a great so, idea. Um, and you can build up that mailing list through other avenues like uh, YouTube, for example, or uh, through your website or even customers that you've had in the past if you have uh, some customers already. Uh, Edie says, you guys have skill. I can't draw anywhere near that fast. <laughs> um, well, again, it's just because we've practiced so much, and I can't tell you the countless drawings that we have done in front of classes of students before, um, and sometimes the same drawing over and over again. Oh, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, so, Like that swing line stapler we mentioned yeah. earlier. Matt and I both it's, drawn that stapler probably a thousand times. I can't tell you how many pairs of eyes I have drawn, or not even pairs of eyes, just one single eye. Yeah. Um, usually left eyes. Uh, so the more you do something, the better you're going to get at it and the quicker you're going to get at it too. Um, and you know, being comfortable with the medium also makes a difference too. So, uh, don't let that discourage you. Um, just understand that these are skills that you can also attain. It just takes knowledge and practice and, uh, it doesn't take a, a huge amount of knowledge. You just need to have a basic understanding of how the material works and also how the elements of art. Uh, work together to create a, a strong drawing or paining. Oh and of course, gosh, I've broken out my my nasal probe. 
Just want to make sure this uh, drawing doesn't have any viruses. Yeah, you didn't use that for testing yourself for COVID, did you? Okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's not. I checked. I went right into the nostril, and we're safe. So. And of course, if you want to learn a lot of those skills, then uh, you can check out the program that we have. Uh, again, there's a link in the description below for that. Uh, that will go into great detail. Probably more detailed than you'd ever want on <laughs> how to draw and paint using a variety of media and also, of course, the basics, core concepts to drawing. If you're brand new to drawing, uh, I get this question I'll ask a lot, which course is the best one to start with? Hands down, the best course to start with is 25 Days to Better Drawings. Um, in that course, each day you learn a new drawing concept, and then it's reinforced by a drawing exercise that's no longer than 45 minutes to an hour. So um, that is a great place to start, and uh, you will see drawing improvement after the 25 days um, for sure. So, um, all right, Jan says, thanks for the great art lessons and a beautiful drawing, Matt and Ashley. Hope next season is not far away. No, we'll probably take, uh, our standard of four, four weeks off yeah, or so. Like that. Um, Ashley's getting ready to start back with students in the classroom, of course. And I need to get back to working on that charcoal course here. I've got the next drawing finished, but I need to, to go into it and edit it and do all the other fun things, making the eBooks and so on. Um, so next week we will be live again, of course, That's right. and that will be our wrap up show. And then we'll take a, a, a brief time off. If you want to be notified when we start the season back, I will send out a newsletter for that. I stopped sending out notifications for getting sketchy when it starts because YouTube already does that. And I don't want to, uh, lambast people with their e in their email bo boxes. But when we do start a new season or end a new season, I'll always send out a newsletter. So um, if you want to be on our newsletter list, if you sign up for the free course videos and eBooks below, again, there's a link below this video in the description, that will put you on our mailing list. And that will ensure that you receive uh, our, our newsletter when we uh, go live again with uh, Getting Sketchy Season 9. We'll have to figure out what... Uh, what gimmick we right we used the there. wheel this time <laughs> we used the wheel i guess the wheel we could was throw so great we could throw darts at a board of possibilities <laughs> bring another another type of skill into this yeah. we'll have to come up with something for next season of course but uh anyway okay uh you're still drawing that's because been, you're still talking i've been talking as like i've been talking because you're drawing thank you I'm trying to give you more I, time i appreciate here. that all right i'm gonna right, i'm officially oh, done now I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop now <laughs> just mush that in and okay we gotta we gotta go we gotta go all right awesome all, all right. right so we're gonna call that one finished of course oh lord have mercy uh, maybe okay. we're gonna call it finished he's okay. still working it's, and i understand that I, I would want to i would be in there adding all the little bricks and i know <laughs> i can't stand it i want to get into that kind of stuff but we got uh, we got all the big stuff in so i feel good jen suggests it. that we keep the wheel i, I kind of like that idea. i do too we could just come up we could put some new things on there maybe we could put you know? some new things on there yeah. i don't know what, what new things we're gonna put i've got pretty much i know the there. art the uh, genres of art i guess subject matter yeah. isn't uh isn't really expanding is it no it's not gonna we change. could get even more specific put specific uh we could actually choose the drawings choose the images we're going to work from oh. but not who's going to draw them that's no, that's not. And then you know, I could choose five, and you could choose five, but we yeah. could end up having to draw from each other, depending on where they fall on the wheel. Mm, that's mm. that's we're, not a bad idea. We're just brainstorming. Yeah, we're here. just brainstorming. Okay, well, let's go ahead and switch out over here. Then. All right, let's do it. All right, guys. Uh, I certainly enjoyed watching Ashley create that drawing in charcoal. I hope you did too, and I uh, hope you learned or at least saw that you don't need to fear the charcoal <laughs> all it does is really make your fingers uh dirty um, but i'll leave you with this because this is a good charcoal story um i remember when i was in my uh first drawing class in when i was uh, in illustration school and i've told this story before but it's pretty funny um there was mm -hmm. a girl in that class um and uh, my my teacher didn't really understand uh some of the customs of the of the united states he was from another country and um sometimes he could be very blunt even though he was just trying to be kind well this young lady we were working with charcoal and she actually had wiped her her upper lip at some point and it did look indeed like she had a mustache um and the the teacher of course stopped the class and told this young lady said you have some charcoal on your mustache. Well, 
this this poor girl <laughs> also did have somewhat of a mustache um so it added insult to injury there but whenever i think of students he, he could have said you have a little charcoal on your on your face yes on your face yes that would have been the place to definitely go. yeah um but he said on on her mustache uh, so anyway when that was said of course the entire class kind of laughed at it that was funny uh looking back it was, it was very sad uh, but whenever i see people with charcoal on their fingers or on their face of course i think of that and i would switch back over to ashley but he's glowing right now and he's basking oh no uh, <laughs> but he's got uh he's got he's in full brightness he would look like an angel if i switched over to yeah. him yeah. oh no that. i can switch over to him because he turned the lights okay. off okay but uh he had uh made it, charcoal yeah better better leave the charcoal off of that don't do that no don't <laughs> is, there, is there something on my face you look like <laughs> it looks like salvador dolly <laughs> It does kind of yeah. Up there you on go. one Just side, finish it off, down on the and other. And there you go. Now that's get, getting sketchy, and it's <laughs> <laughs> it's from there. It's um, not even Halloween. <laughs> you kind of look like a cat with whiskers now. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, so um, and that's another reason why we call this getting sketchy because we're pretty sketchy ourselves. So I hope you enjoyed this last hour. I hope it was entertaining for you. Um, it was entertaining for us. I'm getting ready to switch seats and go over mm -hmm. there and I'm going to continue with my drawing of a uh, vintage car. We're drawing an Austin Healy here and we're using uh, a combination of alcohol based markers and colored pencils. I've done a lot of work with the markers and a lot of work with the colored pencils, but tonight we're switching back to the markers doing some work and then I'm going to be layering more colored pencil applications over the top wow. of that as well. It is a slow process. I think Yeah, but we're I'm looking at what you've done so far. Yeah. It looks great. Oh, yeah, I can't thanks. wait for it to be nice. done. Let's look at Ashley again with this mustache. <laughs> Uh, take a screenshot, I guess. I'm not going to let him watch that off uh, before we go to the live stream. But, uh, anyway, for those of you who are going to be joining us over there in just a few minutes, we'll look forward to seeing you there. If you're not a member yet and you want to join and join us tonight, well, you can do that. There's a link in the description below, of course. And you can start off with a week-long trial for free. That In our trial, a lot of people are confused. Uh, they think that the trial is limited in some way. It's not. You get access to all of our courses, all of the e-books, oh, wow. all the live lessons, everything absolutely for free for the first week so you can see if it's right for you. Um, so anyway, with that, we're going to go ahead and sign out of YouTube and get ready for our next broadcast over at the Virtual Instructor. Uh, good night, everybody.